That's the cool thing about photographs is that they, it's about emotions. Yeah. I mean, both when you shoot and when you see them. I mean, and if you have something that is a, a genuine, something that genuinely captures, genuinely captures the emotions of the person you're photographing, that transmits through the image to the person viewing it. Mr. Carrick. What's up, brother? Here and present, man. I am. I'm in FXV Digital Design, and this is freaking awesome. It's a long time coming, dude. I know, I know. How many of these have you done? This is number 64, 65. <sighs> what, don't you like me anymore? I no, mean, I what, love what, you. you. I love you, you man. You, you wouldn't invite me? It's like, you think I got nothing to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, you've been off on your own journey of greatness. I, I have. And I, I, was, I was there last week. You were? I was there with Will, our, our new designer, Will. Getting his headshot, so he looks all awesome. Uh, so it matches our brand, and yeah, dude, it's crazy when you meet someone and they take great photos. You think to yourself, they're a great photographer, and then you see them again like a year later. Wow, I didn't think you could get better, but you got better. And then now, because we're we're going on what like five years, yeah, knowing each other. Yeah, five, Those shots years yesterday were just, or the last week were insane, and I just really enjoyed listening to you speak about photos and taking the photos and you talking about your subjects and uh, I really enjoyed watching the photos you took of Will though that one shot where I was like I don't care what he says I really want that one <laughs> like just for posterity or you know yeah I wish I'd had my little my little video going when you said that I would have posted that on social media I, yeah, like I would have been like please <laughs> post it man because it's it's weird because you know you a lot of people can take photos you know, I mean, anybody can take photos, technically. Anyone can take a photo. And iPhones make it a little easier for you to take a good photo. <clears throat> oh, let, me, let, me, let me stop you right there for one second. I was going to insult you, but okay. No, no. You can come back and insult me. That'd be fine. Um, anybody can make an exposure. Not everyone can make a photo. Oh, there it is. There it is. You get that snippet? Write that you down. Like, want me to, well, yeah, anybody <laughs> can take a video, but... <laughs> Anyone can turn on a camera. Anybody could make a website, but there wouldn't be a Freddy website. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fucking Wix. <laughs> <laughs> so, Don, I always like to uh, talk to people about, you know, where they come from because everybody knows you. Everybody knows you, Dr. Pixel, busting out in the scene a few years back, doing photography. But we've had a couple of conversations when you went back to, like, where you came from, you know, what you started with. You weren't always a photographer. You were a designer, graphic designer. Yeah. Um, so let's take it back. So born and bred here, what's your dealio? No, no. I'm going to try and keep this really short because I, I, I tend to like make these long. I can't help it. I don't know. I'm going to try and keep it short. Okay, so I was born in the Washington, D.C. area in the suburbs. I was uh, I got went to college at the University of Maryland, got my degree in urban studies and cartography. I got a job doing uh, floodplain mapping when I was right out of college. And for the, and um, who, how prescient is that, you know? Um, I was going to say, how does it, how, it's like, like, how do you apply for that? That, that was, uh, it was an engineering firm and they had a federal contract and they were looking for somebody to make maps. Okay, and cool. And I had the skills. So anyway, so then I got, then I was, I got, I was uh, helping uh, somebody as a teacher at the University of Maryland in a cartographic department. So in the evenings I would go do that, help him teach the introduction to cartography. And um, <clears throat> he was looking for jobs there while he was there. He was uh, filling in for a professor that was on sabbatical. And uh, he, he interviewed at National Geographic. He says, they didn't have anything for me, but they are looking for somebody that you could maybe want to, here's a guy you could talk to. So I called a guy and I, and I said, um, hey, yeah, this guy gave me your name and, and uh, and he said, you were looking for somebody? And he said, oh, I'm not the guy to talk to. He was the head of the cartographic unit. He says, I'm not the guy to talk to about that. You should call personnel. So I called personnel and said, oh, the head of cartographic said I should talk to you about this position. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, come on in for an interview. And it's like, it was stupid dumb luck. I, I, di I didn't, it was no planning. No, it was like stupid dumb luck. But anyway, anyway, I got the job. And so I'm doing maps. And then I, I progressed to doing maps and doing research for maps and doing working for the magazine and and I got a job for another division that did all the maps and graphics for the books and then I got a job as assistant art director in the edu oh, no, no no wait a minute I was a, a designer for World Magazine so I was doing story uh -huh. layouts and I 
during that time, it was in the uh, mid '80s. I bought one of the first Macintosh computers. Nice. One meg RAM, man. One like, meg RAM. It was the shit. <laughs> 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 and I was flopping discs in and out. Oh, it was man. dynamite. Anyway, so I'm figuring out how to use it and do to do freelance because my I had we had had a son and decided that Karen could not go back to work and leave this little baby with somebody else. And so we were figuring out a way to do that. So freelance graphic art was the way to go. Yeah. And so it was like at the very beginning, it was like page maker. Remember, page you, maker. I remember page maker. Yeah, yeah. all this page maker. And then um, anyway, so I'm, I'm figuring out how, I'm getting up like early in the morning and figuring out how to use it, then going to work and then coming home and doing freelance work. And I ended up, talking them in at the World Magazine to getting Macintosh computers to start doing layout because we were cutting and pasting galleys and Xeroxes of black and white pictures and putting them in into boxes. And uh-huh. then they were photographing the layouts and then stripping the pictures in. And it was like a whole thing. And then I'm going, this is, could be way easier. And so that was kind of cool. And then there was another division, the Educational Media Division, they did stuff for schools. Like, remember, remember the film strips? Oh, yeah. They did all that stuff, but they were, like, transitioning to all this digital stuff, and they right. wanted somebody to help them with the Macintosh. And so I was the assistant art director there. They did a bunch of stuff for them, which was kind of cool. And I couldn't stand it anymore. I'd been there for 17 years. But I had managed to transition from doing cartography to graphic design, which I felt was much more portable. Mm-hmm. And then I got a job here at Baldwin Hardware. I got to let go from that. I was a jerk. I won't, I won't <laughs> go any further than that. Anyway, um, and then and then I got a, and then I kind of knocked around for a while. I worked for a large format printing company, and I got a job for um, Arrow International, and that was a great job, and I was really good until I got purchased by Teleflex. Then I got let go from there, mm. and I had always done freelance work, which I think is a good thing, and it sustained me during the in between periods, but um, I was doing like photography and graphic design. I was still focused on graphic design. Yeah. But then I started shooting more to do catalog work and stuff like that. And it's like, man, this is the shit. I want to do this. And then I started, and so I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. I was, I was a track photographer at Maple Grove Raceway, and I was shooting all kinds of cars. I'm shooting stuff for magazines, and I'm getting feature articles, and it's really dynamite. And I'm going, why am I not on the cover of these magazines? I started looking at magazines. I'm going, they have pinup girls. <laughs> 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 well, I better get me some of those. <laughs> and so I started shooting with some women in the, in the – I mean, it was nothing risque or anything, but I started shooting with some women in, in the pictures. And – um I found out I had this knack for connecting with people. When did that start, though? Well, I started shooting for them in 2009. And so between 2009 and 2000 and... What was my last year? 2019 was my... I shot, shot through 2018, and then I did their award ceremony in, the, in the January of 2019. That was my last shoot for them. Was so, that when you first started taking photog- uh, taking photos? or I had always been interested in taking photos. And I have to say, there was a, a moment when my son was small. It was his first birthday, I think. And we had a bunch of people over that smashed the cake in the face kind of thing. you know. And, and here I am. We had a table and had windows on two sides in the room. And I, and I am there with the camera stalking the frickin' event, <laughs> trying to find the right angle and to get the people and get him and get the right moment. And, and I said, I stood up and I went... Damn, I am missing this fucking event. Yeah. And I put the camera down, and I didn't yeah. shoot till I was at, at Arrow a number of years later. I, I just, you know, I took a few snapshots. You know, I took pictures of them getting their diapers changed and stuff, but, you know, it's like... The normal stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was taking snapshots. I was not taking photographs. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's I, a big distinction for me. I think you're right about putting the camera down. I think I realized that uh, at shows recently, when I go to shows just to watch bands I like, and... They come out on stage, and then every phone in the place just lights up. And everybody's sitting there just taking video footage, which I get it. You want to capture the moment. You know it's a show. You paid for it. It's totally cool. But I give myself, like, 20 seconds now. I go to a show. I'll do, like, a 20. I'll take a couple shots. So I remember where I was sitting quickly. I do maybe a video for, like, 20 seconds, and then the phone goes away. And then you just have to, like, live in the moment, because that stuff will actually last longer mm-hmm. than the photos, because I've missed so much. 
know, just trying to take a photo. Oh, I am totally right there with you. I, I, I volunteer for Genesius Theater. You might know this. I don't know. Mm. But I do all their headshots, and I do promo shots for them and stuff. So I go in on the dress rehearsals and take pictures that they can send into the newspaper and stuff like that. And, and <clears throat> I, they had, um, they had a, a show last year called Bright Star. It was written by Steve Martin and Edie Brickell. Ooh. It was an amazing show. It was an amazing show. Um, I won't tell you much detail about the show, but I went and I photographed it two nights in promo for promo stuff in dress rehearsals, and then I photographed the first night of the show to get crowds and stuff like that. Right on. And then I went back and saw it with my wife, and it was so emotional. I cried because the experience of seeing it and just sitting and watching it, it was totally different than me when I'm working uh -huh. and taking the pictures. And so, I mean, I, I totally get it. Yeah, was that a show a few days ago or I don't, whatever? I'm forgetting things now like that happened yesterday. <laughs> when you get to be my age. Right, but it was so cool <laughs> because it was one of those uh, instances where they weren't the headliner, but they were like maybe fourth to last. Mm -hmm. And it was a band I always wanted to see growing up. I was listening to this band in like 92, 93, and it was like, oh, my God, this band's coming to Reading, Pennsylvania, to Reverb. Um, and the other bands that were headlining, I've seen them a million times already. I told my wife, I was like, hey, babe, can you just drop me off in front of Reverb at 730 and come back by 805? <laughs> and that's how old I am now. But it was so cool, though, because she drops me off. I almost didn't go because I was like, I ah, forget it. You know, it's like, no, nah, Fred, you really should go, man. You walk into the place, literally three minutes after I get there, they hit the stage, and you forget about everything for half an hour, you know, and you're just engulfed in, like, them just taking the stage and rocking hard. And that was a hardcore show, so you're, like, I'm kind of in the back now these mm. days. I don't want to get destroyed. <laughs> but it was so cool to just watch them play, and they still got some some gumption to them, you know. They're still rocking, and, and you just you fall in love. And what's crazy is that you – I'm watching this band – and kind of like yours, in your in your way, like you cried watching that play. No, I didn't cry watching the band, <laughs> but I did get emotional in the sense of like, you know, when I first heard these songs, I was in high school and I was in a band with like my best friends, and we were dreaming of doing this one day. And like, even though these guys are like fifty now in their fifties, yeah, they're still living that dream. Like they're not huge; they're not making millions of dollars. They're doing this cause for love. Yeah, and you're just like, I can see the love, and I'm like, ah. Oh. What I would do to just step on stage for like one more time with my buddies, yeah, you know, and I like that it brings you back to those places. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to be in the moment. You know? In the moment, for sure. I mean, I, I actually, I've been thinking, I've been thinking a lot about. I was thinking this week about family. I, I um, went out to Pittsburgh and visited my son and wife and my granddaughter, and my other son came out with my other granddaughter, and so we spent a nice couple of days out there. And seeing those two girls together was amazing and hanging out with my boys and stuff. And it was, it was really great. Um, and then I was thinking, I, I've been thinking that I should have taken photographs. I had my camera there. I didn't take any pictures while I was there. And I've taken a bunch of pictures of the kids and stuff. But it's hard to take photographs of family. I don't know if you find that if you do, if you've done websites for family or design for family. I, I find it really hard to take photographs family. I think a lot of what I do is it's emotional connection mm -hmm. and you're almost too close with family. But on the other hand, I think that you have to make sure that you take those pictures because you don't know when somebody's not going to be there the next day. Yeah. And that is an important thing to do. I mean, for everyone, even if it's just a cell phone picture, but taking photographs of your family that's the remembrance, and I'm. I'd love to have some better pictures of my dad and my mom. You know, it's, it's, you, you you mentioned that, and you take me back because I was in New York this past weekend, and my grandmother was there. She's the only one I have left. She's in her eighties. She's she's frail. She's older. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't want to take photos, but my dad and my mom were like, "Please, can you take some with our kids?" So like you know, she stood up, and I'm holding her. My camera like, hold my grandma. Yeah, you know, on her feet. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm glad I have that photo. But then I think to myself, well, am I glad to have that photo? Because it it took me back years before that. My grandfather, her husband, 
um, it felt weird because so my grandfather, we were at a backyard party in Queens. And my mm-hmm. grandfather's there. And it was almost like everybody could tell or they had the mindset of like, he might not be here next year. Let's all start taking pictures with him. And I felt bad for mm-hmm. him because you were like killing the man at the same time and trying to yeah. honor the man. Yeah. And he's like, he's a very proud guy. We're talking about a man who was like 70 something back, what, 10, 15 years ago now? So mm-hmm. he's like, what the fuck, man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're killing me, but he did it because he loves yeah. his children, his grandchildren. Well, you so, know, I mean, you know, I mean, there are a lot of families that would take a p- family picture every year, and that's mm-hmm. okay. Um, but I think the, the, the thing with having pictures of people is that there, it's not the picture itself that's so important. It's a trigger to bring back those memories. Mm. And it's just like you had a trigger when you went to see the band, brought back memories of what you used to do. And I think it's exactly the same thing. And I think that's the cool thing about photographs is that they, it's about emotions. Yeah. I mean, both when you shoot and when you see them. I mean, and if you have something that is a, a genuine, something that genuinely, capture, genuinely captures the emotions of the person you're photographing, that transmits through the image to the person viewing it. That's why I love that photo of Will that you took last week. Of him laughing? Yeah. Like, so it's crazy. <laughs> so I, for you guys out there, I took my new man, uh, Will Hen Surreal. He's my new designer. And he's like part of the team. I was like, okay, this guy's part of the team. Um, so I took him to Don. And Don did his headshots last week. But, you know, if you've been to a Don Carrick headshot, it's an event. <laughs> you know, it's not just like stand in front of the thing, take a photo, have a good day. Don has fun. Don makes them laugh. Don tries to get the the real person out. And there was this one shot where uh, Will was sitting down and he started laughing. And, like He almost grabbed the edge of the table, but Don hit the button at the right time. And it's so weird because, like, you know, I'm still getting to know Will. But even in front of Will, I was like, Don, I want that photo just for myself because it's not that it's another man or it's not because it's my employee. It's because Don was able to capture that one moment in time of this person in natural happiness, essentially. And I was like, fuck. That was just, that was, to my opinion, the best shot of the day. Even though we went there for headshots, which looked amazing, you hit that moment in time, bro. You hit that button at that one precise fucking second yeah and it was just like magic i mean and it and it is a a moment i mean um yeah i i just i feel like we we connect with people on an emotional level all day long you know i mean i think well i mean i think i talked about this when we were sitting there at the in the studio we have we are hardwired to make judgments about people in a snap, millisecond, a nanosecond. And is this person a friend? Are they safe? Is this, is this animal going to kill me, or am I going to kill it and have dinner? You know, <laughs> it's like we made the, we're, the, we're the people who have evolved from the people who make good decisions in those situations. Yeah. And, and so we make those decisions all day long about people and situations. But... Um, I forgot where I was going with that. Uh, <laughs> how cool is it, though? Um, I mean, I, I do talk about that a lot. But we, we, when we look at photographs, we see, we see in people some sort of an emotional thing. That's the piece that carries. And what, you, what attracted you to that picture was the emotion he was experiencing. And it transmitted to you. And, and, it, and, it, and it gets transmitted to people back and forth when you're, in, when you're talking to them and, and stuff like that. And we can engage emotionally on different levels. Mm. And my job is to get people to open up emotionally so that I can see some of that. And that's why I say that every person is beautiful, no matter what they look like. And, and, and I have to get past all the insecurities and the wondering if it's going to be safe, are they going to be embarrassed, or are they going to like the pictures, all the baggage that they bring in. If I can break that down and connect with them on some sort of emotional level, and it's usually me being stupid. And they say, I can't look that <laughs> stupid. Uh, he's worse than me. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, I, it, is, it is all about breaking that down and having them be there and experience some actual natural emotion. And if I can capture that, I've done my job. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you, 
you I think maybe that's maybe where you progressed. Yeah. Maybe not only in your skill set of, you know, clicking that button, but getting the people to react the way you need them to react in order to get their true selves, yeah. you know, captured. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I always work on the technical stuff and I think I've gotten better in that and that's great. But um, I always tell people, I said, it's not, about, it's not about the technical part of the picture, even if it's a little out of focus or if it's something, which I don't shoot out of focus pictures. So let's just be clear. <laughs> but um, it's always about the emotion. Yeah. And, and most of those things, when you read them on a person's face, it's fleeting. It's like a, it's like a snap second, and, and, it, and you have to be not only lucky, but persistent to try and get that. And that's what I try and do. Yeah, because we were there for maybe a little less than an hour. Some people are easier than others. Right, but <laughs> the point being is that we were there for almost an hour, but we left with four photos, four shots. But like, that's the thing, like, you know, yeah, you have to take a million shots for a reason. You know, you have to just like see what happens and when you mm-hmm. capture it and what this happens here and what happens there and the amount of like even turn. It's funny how like I was watching your process and I've seen it a few times now, but Again, now it's you know just really just paying attention to the moment of what's going on. You see, like even just just changing position of the head, and like how even then the emotion is different. Well, and that that's the technical part, yeah. the positioning and stuff, and it helps people to look good and like it make. I mean, I tell them how to look thinner. I tell them how to s- s- accentuate their jawline and look confident and all those kind of things. But that's that that is totally separate from the emotional piece and the, the capturing the camera and the lights and all that stuff is important. But it's not it's not the thing that sells the picture, that emotional moment. And you know, it's like we connect with people on different levels emotionally. I mean, I feel like I'm pretty connected to you, but, you know, I don't know your life history and stuff. It's not like being in a family. That's a tight, tight bond, an yeah. emotional bond. But, you know, we meet people at networking events, and we might connect with them, and we'll have a feeling about them. But there is no real emotional connection until you get to know that person better, have better interaction. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, so I try and create a safe place where people can be, I don't want to say emotionally vulnerable, but emotionally open maybe would be a better. What do you do when it's rough, dude? Like, what do you do when you're sitting oh, there and you're just I've like. I've had some tough ones. I've had yeah. some tough ones. I usually act more stupid. <laughs> 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 I act more outrageous. I mean, really, it's about getting them to forget they're standing in front of a camera. I mean, fact is, people aren't comfortable being in front of a camera. They, it's not a natural place to be. They're worried about how big their nose is and whether their freckles are going to show up or, you know, they have a big zit on their, or a cold sore or whatever it is, you know, or they, they feel insecure about their their weight, their height, their hair color, their their teeth, their whatever. I got people who, who won't smile. They keep their lips together. And it's like, <laughs> just smile for heaven's <laughs> sakes, you know? And, and, and it's like, maybe I shouldn't pound on the table. Sorry about that. Um, it's, it's all good. Yeah, but... You know, it's I have to try and break through those things. And I would say 99% of the time, I'm pretty successful. I mean, there's some people that are just tough customers. I mean, they're going to walk out of the rear with the best quality headshot they've ever had. Sure. But it may not have that emotional winner badge. You know what I mean? Um, if they just won't let me in. And, and I kind of think of it as a gift that I get from people. I mean, I think what I got from Will was a gift. I could see that. And and for me, I'm honored to be able to do that. And you can tell that you're honored because the the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. You know, by what, what you've given us. Yeah. Um you know, how did you ever think you would like this was gonna be your your career path, even though it's you've done so many things in your life? Well, I mean, when I first started out, I mean I, I for some reason Photography resonated with me, and I loved it. I loved doing it. But, I mean, I was working in the National Geographic. Photographers there, their, their home lives were fucked up. I mean, they, they were divorced. They had two or three different wives. They had kids all over the place. They weren't seeing them. They were being sent all over the world doing these amazing, interesting things. And it, it just it wasn't conducive to having a good home life. And I made a decision that that's not what I want to do. And I was totally focused on more of a an editorial or uh, 
like a, a type of style of photography like they do at the Geographic. And um, I wasn't thinking about, I, oh, I don't want to do commercial photography. Oh, I don't want to do portrait photography. And um, I came, when I started shooting again, I was doing product photography. And then I started doing the car stuff. And it sort of evolved into shooting people. And it ended up being the thing that just really rang my bell. I've always loved pushing the button. Yeah. There's something about it, capturing the moment, never going to be that moment again. And like, what is it? Uh, the progressive commercial where Flo's getting on the bus, but it'll never be decay today again. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the stupidest commercials. Uh, anyway. Yeah, they try so hard. Uh, yeah. But, um, you know, it, it's like there's never going to be another moment like that. There. And I tell people, I said, I, okay, for those on, on our radio dial, I'm waving my hand in front of my face. We have no idea what kind of operation we're running <laughs> most of the time. Right. And you can't tell yourself how to smile, when to smile, and have it look natural. You can't tell yourself to laugh and have it be sound natural. It's kind of like t- trying to tell yourself a joke. You already know the punchline. You right. just, it just didn't work. And um, so my job is to make that happen, make a genuine emotion happen. So it's it's cool to see, um, you know, because um, when I met you, you were rocking and rolling out of your basement, and now you get this really cool studio space in Reading. Yeah, yeah. I I, I mean, I I wanted to be in Reading, connected to Reading. Um, during COVID, I I felt like I, I had a studio space in Philadelphia yeah. that I had was putting together, and then COVID hit, and I didn't really finish it. Um, there were some drawbacks to that space, which I was worried about, but I never gave it, I never really pushed it to the time. I mean, I just never really launched it and, and mm-hmm. did it. Um, so I'm sitting there during COVID and I'm going, I don't want to drive down to Philly. That's a horrible drive. I mean, there's always traffic on the, 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 the ones that, and it's like, I, just, I don't want to do it. I, I just, I don't want, even if it's only one or two days a week, you know, that's what I was telling myself. I would just book there maybe one or two days a week and it would open up my market. And it's like, I said, I don't, I don't want to do that. I, I just, it's just not, I'd rather have Reading become the destination for what I do. Mm-hmm. And things like what I do, whether it's video, animation, marketing, all the things that businesses need to help them sell their products and be better and achieve their goals, it's the stuff that I want to be able to bring to bear in Reading. And I want them to have a destination. And so my goal now is to make Reading better and make it a destination for the kinds of stuff that I do, whether it's web development or whatever. How are you going to do that? Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm starting to get to know people. I've got a project I'm working on right now called Night Moves. Night Moves. Night Moves Reading. And, uh, and go a couple different ways. Uh, yeah. Wait a minute. I think I re- <laughs> renamed it. I mean, no, I changed it. I changed it. I was calling it that, and I kept thinking, that's too, it's too, it's, it's like, I can't, I can't. Light Moves Reading, and it's photographs of Reading landmarks at night with their lights on or whatever, but it includes some sort of movement. And it is combined with uh, an organization here in Reading. So whether it's the Berks Ballet Theater or the cyclists or the runners or or dance people or the Reading Symphony or, or the ballet or the arena or whatever right it on. is. So shooting those landmarks and then so like I shot at the Berks Ballet Theater, I shot some dancers in front of the goggle work sign where they have their thing. And so long exposure, they're all blurry and stuff like that. And um, so it's causing me to get out of my comfort zone, go and talk to people. I really wanted to have the Reading High School Band cross crossing. I, I mean, I have the cooperation of the police department. They're closed down the, the Penn Street Bridge into Reading. For me, and I want to have the high school band marching on the Penn Street Bridge towards West Reading, coming up that rise, Mm -hmm. right? And so I'm shooting that way. And if I use a telephoto lens, it'll bring all the background images like the pagoda and all the stuff straight down Penn Avenue. It'll all be compressed behind them. So have them marching up toward me, and it would be really cool. When are you doing that? 
Well, I've been trying to work that out with the I've been trying to work that out with the Reading High School, and there's been some resistance. So I, they think that the parents aren't going to want to do it and stuff. And I think I have to keep working on them. So I'm 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 going to ask them. Well, would you send home just a questionnaire and ask the parents if it would be okay to do this? I I want to do it. Do you know next year, next 2023 is the 150th year anniversary of Reading? 150. 100 or 150, something like that. But I think it's 150. I think it's 150. Yeah, I think 100 would be too young, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's 150th anniversary, so they're going to do some stuff. So I'd like to be part of that. I'd like to have this. I want to shoot about a dozen images. I want to show them and have a big launch party uh, for the images, like a gallery in the Doubletree right there, heart of the city. It's kind of – and I I am totally about – Craig Poole. That guy is amazing. What he's and I tried doing. to get him on here. Is anybody, can anybody hook me up? Like I got messaged him. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think he recognizes me because I do, I volunteer for the Jazz Fest and the Blues Fest and stuff right like that. So I shoot music stuff. And I see him pretty often for that. And I've done some stuff with the uh, Emerging Entrepreneurs Program. Are you familiar yeah, with that? that? I was on the panel. You were on the panel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe that was the day I forgot to come in, and we were both supposed to be on there. I don't know, but <laughs> I was supposed you to be on there. there that day. I was. I did headshots for all the kids, but I was supposed to be on a panel like two or three days, and and I I totally one day I totally spaced and I missed it. And Gary Gary calls me because oh, are you coming? I'm going coming where? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the worst when you're like waiting for somebody to say what are you talking like, about? Yeah, that's it's bad, like, bad, bad. So yeah, I said, uh, Gary, I'm getting really old and forgetful. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a cool little program that they did. I it was awesome. It. They're going to do it again, too. I'm really excited That's cool. about that. Yeah. Right on, man. Yeah, they should do that again. So next year's 150 for Reading. And so. I want to tie it in with that. There's got to be a way you can get them to do it. I feel like that's a cool shot, dude. It would be awesome. I, and I, that was, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I really had a letdown when I got rejected by them. And um, I felt like, I mean, I've got connections with the mayor. I photographed the mayor. I photographed the for uh, Hispanic Heritage Month mm. a couple months ago. I did uh, Michael Rivera, mm. uh, Johanny. I, I can't remember her last name from uh, Johanny Sabata. Sabata. Yeah. Photographed her in the studio. I photographed the mayor in the um, city hall, and um, it was great. I had all these connections, and I had already met with the people who tra- do traffic and. Building, so I got police connections that are going to close down so roads for me. Shit. You know the mayor, and it's like I know, <laughs> I know, and 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 I just I hit this wall, and I, maybe I just am not, I'm not a pushy person, right? I mean, I'm pretty confident about what I do, but I'm not a pushy person, and I, I just think I need to be more persistent. I think you have to this. use the 150 angle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, listen, it's I, 150 I, next year. I, I keep telling them. I keep telling them. I, I've tried, but anyway, I'm, I'll, I'll keep working on it. What else you got coming up in the uh, the pipeline, my man? Well, we got another season of Genesius happening, so that'll keep me busy. And it's, it's always fun stuff to shoot. They have acquired a collection of costumes. It's the Myers collection. There's this guy who had the Myers Magic Shop out in Templeton, I think Temple, and he spent his life making costumes that were used on. Uh, all kinds of different plays, things on Broadway, stuff like that, and, and, and he getting out of the business, and he just gave it to Genesius. So now they're right. in the process of trying to get it organized so that they can start renting things. So I, I keep pushing them. I, I, they have been really slow doing this. I said, make this a business. Make this a business that supports your theater. It's a great service to, like, the high schools and all these other, like, uh, regional uh, playhouses. Um, they, the things that they have are... Unbelievable. I mean, it is shocking the stuff that they have in every that right now. A lot of it is sitting in piles on a warehouse floor, and every time you pick something, you're like, wow, that's really cool. And you pick the next thing up. Oh man, that's amazing! And it's like unbelievable. And they have like they have tuxedos. They've got fifty different tuxedos, and then that's the black ones. They've got another fifty white ones. Wow. And then they've got wedding dresses, and they've got Indian costumes, and they've got Egyptian costumes, and they've got, I mean, you name it. I mean, like eras, 30s, 50s, 60s. It is amazing what they have. They've got hats and shoes and clothing and accessories, and it's like, it's it's shocking how much stuff is there. Do they have a space? They are um, getting space from, um, I don't know how long, well, 
I'm not sure exactly what the arrangement is, but they have a warehouse space that they have um, been given by uh, Fleet Street, which is a major oh, yeah. sponsor of the yeah. theater. And I've forgotten the lady's name, but anyway, um, yeah, so she's allowed them to use this space. Now, I don't know their limits on that or what the arrangement is, but, you know, she's been very kind in letting them do that. And they've been buying racks and stuff. I mean, they've got racks that are two stories tall, I mean, two, yeah. two tiers tall, and they're full on both sides, and, and, and they, haven't even, they haven't even put a dent in the collection right. yet. I bet. And it's a big space. So, I mean, I don't know if I, I, I've done some stuff where I've gone in, or for like the Cinderella show they just finished. I shot all the costumes of the major characters. So I had them come in and we wanted to do some romance shots. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do romance shots. <laughs> Let me correct myself there. Um, but then I shot like front, back side of each of the costumes. So I want to start to create a library for them and help them get that set up so that they can start to rent that, those things. Because I mean, it's expensive to run that theater. I bet it is. And and they've had problems. They've had the roof leak, which hit the electricity, which caused a fire, and they had to dig up the front of the place and do electrical things and roof things. And it's like they have had big expenses. And that was over COVID. Ugh. So, I mean, they have been lucky to be able to get some assistance from people, but they are, I mean, it's a lot. But well, it's a lot in Reading, though. It's like You just talk about ballet. I'm like, ballet? Yeah. <laughs> They're doing. I, I, they did Nutcracker last weekend, and I was in Pittsburgh. I couldn't go see it. I really wanted to go see it, but hey, what you win some, you lose some. I heard that, my man. Fam, family wins, always. Yeah, it has to. Yeah, Don, tell them how they can find you, my brother. Well, let me see. I, I've got a website. It was made by FXV Digital Design, and it's freaking awesome. Would I'm going to update that? it this year. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, it's going to be really good. So I got I got stuff to do for that. It's um. Studio413.net. I couldn't get the dot .com. Some dance studio down in North Carolina had it. Uh, I don't know. You went anyway, somewhere some. Yeah, I, <laughs> I tried. So anyway, it's dot .net. Studio413.net. That's a great place to find me. Uh, and then I'm on social media. Uh, Instagram, studio underscore 413. Uh, Don Carrick on, on uh, Facebook. I don't post much on Facebook, more Instagram. And then uh, it's Don Carrick and Studio 413, two separate uh, things on LinkedIn. Right on. So I, I try and post there to try and talk to my business clients. Right on, man. Don, thanks for coming in, my brother. It's, I'm really glad you asked me, man. This was fun. It's, it's always was, a pleasure when you come in. We always we always have podcasts, I, essentially. We just never record yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, we sit here for hours practically talking every time we come in. It's true. It's yeah, true. Dude. So I appreciate it, man. I wish you only the best of luck. And 150, man, they definitely let me know what goes on next year because I feel like there's probably going to be a lot of stuff that I don't know about. Yeah, yeah. So I need to get my shit together. I'll try and I'll try and pull myself out of the doldrums and make it happen. Thanks Figure for the encouragement, out, man. <laughs> All right, man. I'll talk to you soon. Fist bump. Yeah. Hey, thank you for checking out this episode of Fred Talk. If you dug what you saw, make sure you like and subscribe so you never miss another episode. You can also check us out online at fredtalk.tv. Don't forget, your Uncle Freddy loves you. Peace.